Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful and the church is so blessed to have these ladies who are interested enough to learn your word that they would take time out in the middle of their day to come and study it. I'm thankful for the fellowship that we're all sharing, the laughing, and uh, it just lifts our spirits when we can gather together and, and, and joke and enjoy each other's company. That's a gift from you. It's uh, a special kind of fellowship that believers have, and we're very thankful for that. We're also thankful for the gift of prayer where we can lift concerns and cares from our life off our table, off our plate, and give them to you, and uh, we endeavor to do that now. We ask that you would be with Elaine Carpenter's family, with Bill and uh, with his daughter and others uh, that are going to come to the memorial service this Saturday. May it be a good time of fellowship and friendship, but also a time of faith, uh, a time to continue mourning and yet look forward to the truth that you have, that we will see Elaine again in eternal life and that she is with you and she is happy. Be with Rita and her family as they mourn the passing of her brother, Wayne. Give her strength and comfort as she grieves. Be with uh, Jill's family. We give uh, thanksgiving for uh, the healthy birth of uh, Simon and uh, ask that she would be with mom and dad and just keep that baby healthy and that they would take him uh, under the waters of baptism that he can safely join uh, our great fellowship here in the church. We also give thanks for Rachel and Austin and the healthy birth of uh, Declan and ask that uh, his health would continue. They would bring him under the waters of baptism and uh, you would watch over them as they grow together as a family. Be with all those who are being affected by the heat wave, especially those that don't have central air. Uh, bring relief, Lord. Uh, you are in charge of the weather. And uh, this is for our good, even when we don't understand it, but we ask that there would be a break and that those people that don't have hair, air and who are suffering would find a place or a place would be provided for them to seek and have relief. Be with Al and Arlene and continue the healing in Al's life and supporting Arlene and Carrie and Vicki as they care for him. Be with, uh, we give thanksgiving, Lord, for Sue. Uh, and that she is pain-free and her kidney stone was removed. We ask that that uh, healing would continue in her life. Thank you for the healing that's been in my life over my foot. I ask that would continue so I would be enabled to uh, be a better servant for you here in this place. Uh, be with Connie and Joe, especially the struggles that Joe was having, concerned about his PET scan coming up. Uh, help him with those, Lord. You are a God who provides comfort and strength, uh, and uh, you're present with us when we are scared. Be present with Joe as he waits for this scan. Uh, may it be telling. May it uh, show him the truth of his condition. But Lord, we ask that there would also be healing and restoration in his life. Uh, be with Andrew and Emily as they travel. Give them safe travels to their destination and back. Uh, Thanksgiving, Lord, or in order for the healing you've done in Ruth's life. Uh, you've healed her body, but I'll also help with her anxiety and the stress that it's upon her. We ask that you would relieve that for her. Uh, be with uh, all those who are struggling with COVID-19, either with fear of catching it or those that have it and are struggling to recover. And Lord, anytime, uh, remove this virus from our midst so we can return to regular ministry. But until that time, help us as church leaders and as the church to continue to do the ministry that you've given us. Show us the way, show us how we can safely do it and reach out to those around us that need our help. Uh, be with Barb Pike who can't attend and she's, she's down and it upsets her, but Lord, find a way. We ask that you would find a way for her to participate in our studies and that she might be able to return soon to our midst in our Bible study. We thank you for the healing that you've done in Phyllis's life. We ask that that would continue. Uh, keep her stomach pains away and just be with her through all the things she's got going on, Lord. Uh, be with the doctors and the medicine that they might continue to be your source of healing in her life. And be with Mary and Bob as they uh, safely travel back home from up north. Bring them safely back to our midst and watch over them. Be with us now as we study your word, O Holy Spirit. You be the teacher. Engender in our hearts love for Jesus and an understanding, a greater understanding of who he is in our life and, and just how great is uh, his work of redemption and salvation for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, we are in uh, chapter 23 of Exodus. And uh, we had just gotten done in the first part of 23. It was, uh, they were talking about things that have to do with being in court, court cases. Does anybody remember anything from that? What kind of a witness are you supposed to be? An honest witness, right? 
And even though we're supposed to have compassion for the poor and the underprivileged, how should that affect our testimony in court? Still be truthful. Yes, even if it, even if it works to the detriment of the underprivileged, we have to tell the truth. And we talked a little bit about uh, whether today or not you have to uh, swear on the Bible when you give testimony. And does anybody remember what we discovered with that? Do, does everybody do that still? No. No. Some, some, you, you raise your right hand and you say that uh, you give an affirmation oath. Under the penalties of perjury, I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm the evidence I shall give will be the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So you're swearing on yourself. You're not swearing on anybody else's name. And why is that a problem for us as Christians? What do we know about people? Sinful and perverted to the core. And who are we to swear on our own selves that we'll tell the truth because we often don't even tell the truth to ourselves or to God. So we do need somebody outside of us to hold us accountable and to be accountable in our midst and our conscience when we tell the truth. And if we undermine justice, how's the Lord going to, what's the Lord going to do? This is back in verse six. Genesis? Uh, nope, Exodus. Actually, it's not verse six. Um, the answer I'm looking for is if, if he, oh, this is from second Corinthians. Maybe I cited this. Uh, he will not acquit those guilty of perverting justice. They will appear before him on the last day and have to answer to what they do. So he takes, takes injustice on the part of us as Christians and non-Christians seriously. All right, let's move on now. And, uh, we're in chapter 23. Let's read verses 10 through 13 of chapter 23. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its field. In the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may be, and what you need to do is what you want to eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, so that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Pay attention to all that I have said to you, and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Okay. Out of those 10 commandments that we remember Moses gave uh, many chapters back, which one is this relating to? Remember the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath. And uh, that's when we're not supposed to do any work on the seventh day. And here we have kind of an expansion on that. The Sabbath day covers not just men, but also Stones. servants, animals, beasts, all of your family, and, and all those that work for you. And so what, what kind of a Sabbath are we talking about here? What's supposed to observe the Sabbath besides men and beast? Verse 10. For six years, plow the field and the seventh let it rest. So this is dealing, huh? Sojourners. Of yeah, but no, is it it's the land itself? The land, the, the land. Sabbath so itself. The year, let it rest in my valley. Yes, the Sabbath itself has to observe a, a a rest, a Sabbath rest. Now, for those of you that know anything about growing or agriculture, how is this? How is this a great idea from an agricultural point of view? They rotate fields. They rotate. They rotate. Why do they rotate fields, Karen? take more from the soil than others. I don't know. I'm not a farmer, it, but it's I It's like giving it vitamins. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can wear, we can wear the ground out by constantly planting. Yeah. And so they, they rotate fields. Well, the part of it is because there's different kinds of dirt that do better with different kinds. Of, and I'm not a farmer either, yeah. but, I, but I do know if you let it rest for a while, if you, if you put manure on it and you put stuff on it and you let it rest, uh, then when you do go to plant the following year, it comes back even better. So it's an agricultural fact. It's God's Sabbath built into how he created the world and the land, at least how he deals with a fallen world. Uh, chances are, don't know what it was like, but before the fall happened, we probably wouldn't have that problem with growing stuff. Everything would grow like gangbusters. This is all the result of the curse of the ground that 
God gave before Adam. Anyway, so yeah, um, this is the first mention of something called a sabbatical year. And we're going to read a little bit more about that. Keep your fingers here in Exodus and uh, turn to Leviticus chapter 25. And Jill, let me know if you have any, uh, any questions on that little notepad here. Okay. It's a big notepad, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I know Gary said he uh, got a back strain when he tried to pick it up the other day. <laughs> 25 what verse? Uh, I haven't got there yet. It's Leviticus 25. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. It's the next book up. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 7. We should, yeah. <laughs> By the time I'm done, you're going to know them because I'm going to take you every single place. I keep a record of the books we haven't been yet and try to get you there. No, I don't. <laughs> okay, are we there? No. Uh, let's read uh, ver the first seven verses Leviticus 25. Verses 1 through 7. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather it in its fruit. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself, and for your male and female slaves, and for your hired worker and the sojourner who lives with you, and for your cattle, and for the wild animals that are in your land. All the field shall be for food. Okay. If we go back to verse 1 of Leviticus 25, uh, where are they at? Where is the Lord speaking to Moses? He's still there. One book later. Uh, it's important to realize that a lot of, some of this is an expounding of what we have in, in Exodus. Leviticus means law. So it's kind of like the book dedicated to all the laws that God gave his people. So Exodus is kind of an overview. And a lot of times in Leviticus, you'll find uh, a little bit more information. And then even more in Deuteronomy, because that's Moses reminding everybody about what they're supposed to do and not do before they go into the promised land. So anyway, we do have some additional information on what the Sabbath year is supposed to be. And uh, what are you supposed to not do to your field or your vineyard? Yeah. So for six years, you can sow your field and you can prune your vineyard. But that seventh year is a year of solemn rest. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. So what are they going to eat? Some of it's what they, you eat the year before. Will, will some of the land still produce crops that year? Yes. So you eat what is you can eat what is produced on its own but as far as planting no you can gather by hand but all the other stuff the pruning back of the of the grapes you don't do it for but a year. Did everybody do it at the same time supposed to you know because like seven seven years it could be rotated like this year it's my farm and next year it's somebody else's it's farm. Worth that, uh, nope. Specific. No, it was, it was a Sabbath. It at the same time. Sabbath year for everybody. Would they be used to this? No. No. Think back about the manna. What was what happened with the manna? No. He gathered on Saturday twice as much or Sunday. Because God provided twice as much, right? So for six days you gathered. There was nothing on the seventh day and you didn't go out to gather it. And if you gathered extra throughout the week, it would go bad, except for that sixth day. You could gather extra and it would stay, it would keep. And that's the same idea here. 
uh, if they honored this God on that year before the Sabbath year would provide extra for them. So they had enough left over. Plus they could eat what naturally grew in the field. A year of solemn rest. Uh, how would this make the Israelites see the land and what they harvest from it? Especially if they're surviving just upon what was grown the year before and then what grows on its own that Sabbath year. They respect the land for one thing. It's a God's gift to them. <laughs> it's God's gift, right? It, it's, it's not about what I planted or how good I am at planting or, or any of that. It's God's blessing. God blessed them that year before the Sabbath. And then God continued to bless them with what grew on its own. And God made sure that they had enough. And it would be a matter of faith, right? It's the whole first fruits kind of thing. You would do this in faith that God would provide enough for that year. Would this be an easy thing? No, but the fact that they had been doing it with a manna and it wasn't supposed to be for 40 years, but it's going to be because they're going to disobey him about originally going into the promised land because they did the manna thing for 40 years. Do you think it was in their habit now? For 40 years, they gathered on for six days and not on the seventh. And the new generation has grown up with doing it. Because mom and dad did it, and mom and dad pounded into their head to do it. They weren't going to gather manna anymore when they get to the promised land, but this is going to be instilled in them. And they were supposed to teach it to their kids. Uh, questions on that much? Otherwise, we, uh, we need to look at something else in regards to this. We're going to turn uh, two books later to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 15. This is another development that's in connection with the Sabbath year. Deuteronomy 15, and we want to read the first two verses and then skip down and read 9 through 11. This is Moses talking to them before they enter the promised land. They're on the verge of the promised land. This is Moses' farewell speech to them because he can't go. And he's reminding them how to, that they need to be faithful and here's what they need to do. So uh, Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 2. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor shall release what he has lent to his neighbor. He shall not exact it of his neighbor his brother because the lord's release has been proclaimed so on the seventh year you didn't plant you didn't sow you didn't reap and what else happened release your credit for the debt your debt your debts yeah your your uh, your house payment <laughs> it would be nice <laughs> forgiven every seven years forgiven can we go back to that <laughs> That'd be great, wouldn't it? Is that why where the lucky seven came from? I wonder. Because Could be. It's, it's I, I don't. Seven, you know, you hear lucky. I'm gonna do what my uh, seminary professors did. Ruth, that's an interesting question. Go home and research that, and come back next week with a five-page paper. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it very well, very well could be. But that seventh year is the same, just like when you're keeping. So like if you borrowed money on the sixth year, then you only have to pay for that one year and it's forgiven. Wow. There's, and there's, there's something else to read about that. So let's skip down and read verses nine to 11 in that same chapter, Deuteronomy 15 verses nine to 11. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart and you say the seventh year, the year of release is near and your eye looks grudgingly on your poor brother and you give him nothing and he cried to the Lord against you and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely and your heart shall you know, shall not be begrudging when you give him oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting all fogged up here. <laughs> now, you shall give to him freely and your heart 
Michelle, in all your work and in all that you undertake, did I skip one? Yeah. 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 See? You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudgy when you give to him, because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all your undertaking. There we go. Thank you. One more verse. Okay. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore I command you, you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Oh, did you see how I did that? I just plugged it on purpose. So. <laughs> <laughs> What what is what additional information is this telling us in regard to the seventh year forgiveness of debt? What is it? What is it? What problem? What 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 problem could could it could the seven year repayment? People wouldn't want to loan you money. Yes. Because they're not going to get much of a back. Faith. It's the sixth year. Faith needs money. She's just got one more year, guys. She can make it. Or I'm going to give her just a little bit, not enough to help her this year, because after all, yeah, what instead are you supposed to do? Even though it's very close to that seventh year, what are you supposed to do? Help them without regard to that. Yeah. Still be gracious and merciful. What was that? She said, yeah, mom. Okay. Uh, now, connected with this, so this is every seven years, you don't plant, you don't sow, the land gets a rest, you get a rest, your creditors get a rest. Now, building upon this, every 49 years, so after seven Sabbath years, right? Seven periods of seven Sabbath years, another special things happen. And let's read about that. Let's go back to Leviticus chapter 25. So what do you do during that, seven, that okay. seventh year? Not you pick lint out of your belly button. <laughs> you, you live off what, what you've gathered before that and put in your storehouses. So you don't have to... Well, you might still want to go out and pick some grapes. Yeah, you, might, yeah, you, you, you could pick what naturally grows in the land, but you, okay. you would be having pretty much a Sabbath. It might be a year that you could work on your house unless it was Saturday or Sunday. Yeah, Saturday was a Sabbath. You could do that kind of stuff. But as far as planting and tilling or making your animals work. Hmm. You still have to milk your cows. Yeah. Yeah, because that would be bad for them. Yeah, you could do that as long as it wasn't the Sabbath. <laughs> right. Good point, uh, Faith, because this regards the ground and the planting of the ground. All right, so uh, read Leviticus 25, 8 through verses 23. And the title of this in my Bible and your Bible is, This is the Year of Jubilee. Yep. So now we get to hear about the Jubilee. Go ahead, 8 through 25. 23. You shall count seven weeks of, of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of, of years shall... Give you 49 years. Okay, stop there. You guys get what they're saying? Mm -hmm. Seven periods of seven years. So the 49th year. Okay, Faith, continue on. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the 10th day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it, you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property. And if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after Jubilee. And he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price. And if the years are few, you shall reduce the price. For it is the number of crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. 
Therefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my rules and perform them. And then you will dwell in the land of security. The land will yield its fruits and you will eat your fill and dwell in its security. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather our, in our crop? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives. One more. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Okay. Quite a thing, isn't it? So after seven Sabbath years, on the 49th year, um, and you, you, it would be a regular Sabbath year where you don't plant and you don't uh, sow, that 49th year you can gather the vine, from the vine what grows. But then the 50th year, once again, you don't plant, you don't sow, you don't even take the grapes from the undressed vines. You can gather what grows naturally in the field. So for two years, you're not planting or harvesting. Now it's two years because it's the 50th year. But what promise does God give at the end there? Yeah, three years. Well, the, the third year is the year that you plant. So you're not going to get anything until the crops come in. That's the part of the third year. He'll give you extra, right? So on that 49th, the 48th year, you're going to have a gangbuster crop because he's going to give you enough to last. Now, um, the name Jubilee. The name comes from the name of the horn the Israelites were to blow to mark the Day of Atonement. When the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the Lamb for the forgiveness of all the people's sins. So this is directly regarded to this one holy day every year when the priest would take the blood of a lamb into the Holy Holies, the only time he could go into there, and sprinkle the blood on the top of the ark, which was called the mercy seat. And the presence of God was over the ark. Now, relate that to what Jesus did for us. Gave his blood for us. The lamb of sacrifice, the lamb of sacrifice, his blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat of the cross, which was before the presence of God to declare all men, Jew and Gentile, forgiven of all their sins. All of those days of atonement that they celebrated were all looking forward to Jesus' once and final sacrifice. Every Sunday, we celebrate the enduring and lasting Day of Atonement. They don't celebrate hardly any of this stuff. They still celebrate the Day of Atonement, yes. Mm -hmm. But not like this. No, you can't sacrifice because the temple's not there and there's no altar. But, but, they, they, but they don't not plant crops for... Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint. This, this was a great idea, but it takes a lot of faith to actually do it, okay? All right. I was wondering how long they actually... But let's, let's, let's go back and finish learning about it, then we'll talk about how they practiced it. Um, so that would mean 49 years. What would happen in one person's lifetime? It would happen about 12 years. This. It, once in your lifetime, you would receive a complete, clean slate. Every year on the Day of Atonement, you received a clean slate spiritually. But once in your lifetime, you received a clean slate period. So if I fell into hard times and I had to sell my land to faith, what would happen after 49 years to my property? I get it back, right? Even if I haven't really paid off the loan, I get it back. Now it, it does talk about, um, uh, all those that were sold into slavery to be set free. I'll get to that. Let's go back to what I was talking about. Um, if now it's 10 years to the next year of Jubilee, when Faith and I do our dealings, uh, when she pays me for the land that I give her, she would take into account how many years until the year of Jubilee. 
So she would pay me more if it was further away. If it's that first year or second or third year after the year of Jubilee, uh, I would get more for my property selling it to her because it says in here, you're buying the number of harvests, the number of crops. So if I'm, if I'm selling her, if I actually, I'm selling her 40 years worth of crops, if it's only 10 years in, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if there's only three years of crops that I'm selling her, she's going to, she's only, she only has to give me less. But, but then if you wanted to keep that land, you'd have to renegotiate after the year of Jubilee. <laughs> No, no, you give it, it. At, 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 after, on the 50th year, it comes back to me for good. If, oh, I'm, you sold it to me. if I'm still in hard straits, maybe, but I get it back. And the money, the amount of money you gave me was for those years that I worked for you and the crops that you took from my land. That's the money that you give in return for me. You bought those crops from me. So everything goes back to where it was to begin with. Yes. All right. I'm not the, 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 bill, the bill of our agreement, Faith, that says you sold me my land and I gave you this money. Um, and so each one of those crops are my installment back to you for the money you gave me, right? At, on that 50th year, you would take a stamp and you would put paid in full. This agreement is done. Pastor Mark owes me no more. Here is his title to his land, his deed his house, everything goes back to him. Now, remember earlier when that happens, when you let a slave go free, because I'm really, that's what we're talking about here. You don't let me go free, so I'm going to fail. You would have to make sure that I had enough to start again. So that would all be included in this whole price. The years of drought, didn't that mess up the seven years? <laughs> it would have, except what does God promise? If you that do it's this, not happen to you. No, it's not going to happen. You're going to have, there's going to be no problem. If you keep to this faithfully, God will faithfully make sure. Then so he sent them to the land of milk and honey. Uh -huh. So what does that tell us that there were droughts in the land? They weren't following. No, it they, wasn't a desert back then. It was lush. They didn't follow. There's evidence that they didn't follow it. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's, it, it doesn't, you don't find that in scripture. You don't find any of the prophets saying, particularly you didn't follow the year of Jubilee. But they do mention time and time again, they were faithless and they didn't follow God's commands. And this is probably a big one of them. They didn't follow. It. Um, the theme here is freedom. Go ahead, Jill. So at the end of our reading, it's talking about the land shall not be sold in perpetuity. So did you yep. actually buy the land or you just bought the crops from the land? How just did bought that... the crops. Because who, who do you think owns the land? God does. God does. Do we think that way today? No. no. Vicki, Carrie, Janet. Well, Janet, you're not in the house anymore. You guys, you don't really own your house. It's God's. Mm -hmm. I love Blake Shelton's song, God's Country. He said, you know, we just weren't the land, but it belongs to him. You know, the, the Native Americans saw that. They didn't own the land. They were, they were guests there. And whatever, whatever they called God is the one that owned the land. And that part they had right. A little, a little hint of truth and amidst all of the messed up religious beliefs that they learned from wherever. Um... Yeah, that is the underlying principle. So on the, on the Day of Atonement is when this all kicked in. The ram's horn blew on that 49th year, and it all started. Very much connected with this idea of forgiveness of sins, because that's really what it's supposed to emphasize. It's another way for us to see, it was for them to see God's merciful grace through the sacrificial system. But for us, it's another look back and explanation of just what Christ does for us. And Paul picks up on this in Romans, and we'll eventually get there in our readings in church, I believe. But uh, Jesus came not just to redeem us, but he's going to redeem fallen and broken creation, which is your greatest hint that in the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to have trees and you're going to have grass, and it's going to be beautiful. It's a return to the Garden of Eden. That is going to be restored, not in this world. He's going to recreate everything because sin has infected this and ruined it. But you're going to have trees to go sit under. 
I don't know what we'll live in, but I imagine it'll be houses. And maybe we'll have some crops to grow, but what it'll be fun. We'll all enjoy being gar gardeners and farmers. And you aren't going to have to fight with weeds and drought because that ain't going to be anymore either. <laughs> no aches and pains. Jill, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, I was, first, I was going to say it's that mansion, right? So the, the question I had is when Jesus came, and let me ask this way, I guess. When Jesus was put on the cross, where were they in this whole process of the seven years? Good question. Maybe they were there. Maybe Jesus died on the 49th year or the year of Jubilee. I don't know. Um, the problem is, is it wasn't faithfully kept. Okay. We don't have record of them keeping it. It's not mentioned in the Bible until the exile to Babylon occurs. And then Jeremiah mentions it in passing that while well, they're gone in exile, those 70 years, the land finally receives its year of jubilee. It gets its rest because nobody's left to plant or grow or anything on it. All the people are taken away. Uh, and it was only, uh, this is a Jewish opinion. Uh, this isn't from the Bible, but some of the Jewish scholars and scribes that wrote commentaries on the Old Testament, they stated it was only applicable when Israel occupied the promised land. When the Northern Kingdom, because you might remember uh, after David, or after Solomon, the whole kingdom of Israel split in half. The 10 tribes to the North became their own country because they didn't like Solomon's son, Jeroboam was gonna rule because he was really a prick. He, he decided uh, that he was gonna be even harder than his father was and he was gonna exact and make them work like slaves so he could have an even better palace or whatever. So the 10 tribes to the North split and so you had the Northern Kingdom, which was the 10 tribes, and the Southern Kingdom, which was Judah and Benjamin. So when the Northern Kingdom, and they went to exile first, Assyria took them into exile, and they were gone. And, and those are the 10 lost tribes, because unlike Babylon, Assyria didn't keep them separate. They moved them back to uh, over beyond where Babylon was, and they intermarried, and now they're Gentiles. They're gone. When the, so the, the Jewish opinion is when that northern kingdom left, Israel no longer occupied the land, so they did not have to keep this whole Sabbath year or years of Jubilee. Now looking what happened, because the, they continued, the, you know, Judah eventually fell into apostasy just as bad as the northern kingdom, and they had droughts, times of drought. So was the Lord blessing them for this decision? No. No, not at all. For this and other reasons is why the Lord exiled first the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. I mean, it talks about the fact that they were faithless, that they didn't follow his commands and didn't worship him. There were other things they did, but this was one of them. And over and over again with Isaiah and Jeremiah, you see one of the complaints is you're not dealing fairly with each other. You're cheating one another. You're not being gracious and merciful to one another. And this would be a big reason because this would be a, a big part of it. Not forgiving debts like you're supposed to would be a big part of it. So, Jill, that's why we don't know. But knowing how the Lord works, I, I like that. I've never thought of that before. But wouldn't it be something that that, when Jesus died, that was the year of Jubilee? Well, he'll have to research that, it, Unfortunately, he didn't. <laughs> he, he, did it, he didn't die on the Day of Atonement because that's in the fall. It's usually in October. So, but there is this. And, man, I'm getting kind of far afield here. But, um in history, I'm not sure if it's the history of Israel or just the general kind of history of the Near East, it was said that great men were conceived and died on the same day. So we believe Jesus was born on or around December 25th, right? He could be. I know there's talk that there was the, 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 the it was, it was created by the church to fight against the, uh, pagan holidays, but what if the pagan holidays split up around the truth of the gospel? Anyway, if you count back nine months, you have right around the time that Jesus died on the cross. So the day he died, Good Friday, could have been the day he was conceived. And nine months later, Mary gave birth. We don't know. 
So don't take that to the bank. I'm not telling you anything. But but there, but the this part is true. Around the time he died, nine months later, we celebrate his birth. So did he was we really born on December 25th? I don't know. Uh, the Bible doesn't say. I think because we already make a big deal of the day of his birth, we would make it even more holy and worship the day and not the man that was born on. Same thing, we're not sure where he was born. We would make that hollow ground and leave sacrifices for it and do all kinds of pagan things that uh, God would, would anger God. But anyway, good. Um, other questions or comments on this? Is this neat or what? Yeah. yeah. It is. And it explains, and you guys brought up a great point, it explains why... Um, even though God promised them this land of, of honey, milk and honey and fruitfulness, why they had times of drought. It was all disciplinary. It was God telling them, turn back to me. Be faithful to the commands that I've given you and have faith. It would take great faith to honor this year of Jubilee and even the Sabbaths, Sabbath years, but that's what God called them to. And he promised that if they kept it, he would respond. It's all about faith, isn't it, faith? Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> okay, uh, if we have no other questions, let's let's uh, move on. Um, we're still in, we're back in Exodus 23 now, and we're going to read verses 14 through 19. Exodus 23, verses 14 through 19. in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I commanded you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty handed. You shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You should not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Okay. The last part of verse 19 there we're going to save for the last. I want you to put that aside, okay? <laughs> Let's talk about the rest of it. I will address that. So uh, what is God telling them? How many times a year are all the males supposed to come to Jerusalem? Three. 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 Keep in mind, they haven't got to the Jerusalem yet. They haven't got to the promised land. In fact, so they really don't know where God is going to eventually construct his temple. So there is no talk of Jerusalem. It would eventually be Jerusalem. But just telling him, when you get there, where I set up my permanent worship sanctuary, your males need to come three times a year. And so let's look at those. The first one is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That should ring a bell for you. We talked about it back in uh, chapter 19. What is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Passover. Yes. It's connected with Passover. So we celebrate Passover that one night when the angel of death passed over, but then you continue on um, for, uh, was I think 10 days, you celebrate it. Because just one day wouldn't be enough, everybody would forget it. So they make a big celebration out of it. Um, and on that, it's unleavened bread. So what are you not supposed to do? Yeah, put yeast in any of your bread. And also, uh, well, at least the way they celebrate it now, the first which would be the actual uh, uh, day of the Passover day. And then the last one, those are big festival times. Those are big meals when the family gathers together. Uh, and what are we celebrating there with the Passover? It was to remind them of what? That they came out of Egypt. And they came out of Egypt, they snuck out, right? When no, Pharaoh wasn't looking? They came out victorious. And why? How did God show his might? Well, he, he slayed the firstborn of every man for, was it man, woman, and child? And nope, just boys. boys. Firstborn males and, and the animals. 
Awesome. And the animals. Yeah, you're a tree hugger. You would remember the animals, especially, wouldn't you? Those poor animals. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so uh, he, he showed that he was mightier than any of their gods. And uh, so even the Israelite boys were murdered, right? If they didn't put the blood of the lamb on the, over the door. But all of them, as far as we have from Scripture, all of them did. And what did the blood of the lamb do? It was kind of like a talisman. It had the force in it, right? Which conjured and put special forces in it? Why did the blood of the lamb keep them safe? Showed them because a sacrifice had been made in place of that boy, right? The lamb sat, was sacrificed in place of that firstborn male. And this all looked forward to one final sacrifice, which was, right. and his blood shed on the wooden cross, the wooden door frame, the wooden cross, that really was the power behind the lamb's blood. Whole sacrificial system was all looking towards Christ as the final sacrifice in our place. You don't die. Your firstborn son doesn't die. Instead, the sacrificial lamb, which was Christ, he dies. And they were supposed to all to get this when Christ came along. And uh, afterwards, when you read Paul and you read uh, some of the other, uh, the apostles finally got it after the resurrection. It all kind of fell into place. Unfortunately, most of the Jews didn't get it. All right, so there's two other times when all the males are supposed to appear before the Lord, right? What's the second one? Feast of Harvest. Feast of harvest. It's also known as the Feast of Weeks. As we read through the Bible, you'll see that. And we know it by another name, and it happens 50 days after Passover, or seven weeks. And what do we celebrate 50 days after Passover? Easter, Easter lasts for... Uh, Seven weeks. Pentecost. Pentecost. And Pentecost is a word that means 50. Yes. And so the Feast of Harvest was to celebrate the first fruits at the beginning of the grain harvest. With a faithful expectation, more was to come, right? That's the whole idea behind first fruits. You give your first fruits, the best of that first harvest, in faith that God's going to provide more. And so at Pentecost, we celebrate the first fruits of spiritually the church with the promise that more was to come. And that first fruit was those, all those people that responded to Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost and wanted to be baptized. Was it 3,000 or something? That's Pentecost. And so God picked this day to emphasize something to the Jews, didn't he? He knew this was going to happen back when he's creating all of these holidays. It's all looking forward to Christ and the church. And by the way, the church is not some new kind of being. The church is the reformed Israel, the Old Testament church. Israel had gone apostate. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. So now God has reformed the church by picking Jews and Gentiles to do his job of spreading the gospel. All right. So there was one other one. What's the first? What's the third one? That was celebrated in the fall. Uh, it's, uh, it was to celebrate uh, the gathering of the final uh, year's crops of fruit, oil, and wine. It's also called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Jews still celebrate this. Uh, it happens in the fall. Um, back, back down in Southfield area, uh, during this time, they would all have these huts that they would build out in their yard. And they would have like, uh, um, not palm branches, but leafy branches to kind of cover the top. And they would live in them for a week. And that recalled how they were, they were temporary residents as they wandered throughout the 40 years in the desert. And that God helped them and brought them through and protected them. Did very many people actually do that? The Orthodox did, yeah. Orthodox. Yeah. Uh, the non-Orthodox, I kind of doubt it. And it was also during this season that you would have the Great Day of Atonement happen during this, this time. What do they do instead of the Great Day of Atonement? They still celebrate it. It's called, uh, uh, well, there's Rosh Hashanah, which is the New Year. And the Day of Atonement is called Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. I believe I have that right. So they do celebrate it. It's a holy day. Um, they have special meals and stuff. 
it still is a time when they believe that God completely forgives all of their willful sin, but they can't sacrifice because there's no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How they work that out that God still forgives them without the sacrifice, I couldn't tell you. I never got that deep into Jewish theology, but I'm going to guess that maybe it's a lot like what the Catholic Church does with the saints. Um, the sacrifices from the past built up enough credit for them, or they're looking forward to when they can be restored. I don't know. But you cannot, you cannot sacrifice when the temple's not there. So the 70 years of exile, they weren't doing this either. They weren't celebrating any of this. All this had to be restarted when they returned to the land. Do we as a church have three big festivals that we celebrate? And we have actually more than three, but think about the three big ones when people that are just borderline Christians or nominal Christians or the family of Christians come to church. What would those three be? Easter, Easter. Christmas. Christmas, Thanksgiving, or New Year's. Thanksgiving. We don't. We don't have anything New Year's. We don't. I don't celebrate New Year's. But yeah. See, a lot of churches don't do Thanksgiving. Yeah. Well, they're going to hell, Faith. <laughs> they, you know. I was thinking maybe more Good Friday. That's part of it. That's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. We. How many? How many people from outside the church family come to Good Friday? I know a lot of. Well, think of we're big into Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday. Only the Catholics and the Lutherans. Yeah, Monday, yeah. Thursday is. The rest of them look at you like, what are you Baptists, they don't celebrate Good Friday. There's they a lot of. No, and they sing Good Friday songs on Easter Sunday. I'm like, oh. the, yeah, the focus, they, they, they focus a lot on Jesus' death on the cross, and they kind of are very light on his resurrection. Um, they, they look for the punishment that he did to take away their sins. They don't but... go to church on Christmas either. Hmm. Yeah. Mother, my mother-in-law, you know, John was brought up Baptist, and, he, and I'm like, aren't we going to church? We went down there for one Christmas. She's like, no, why would you go to church? <laughs> I'm thinking, what? They think of it as a pagan holiday, probably. Yeah. No, I don't know. Yeah. She celebrated yeah. Christmas. Yeah. 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 But they didn't, and they didn't, you know, they don't have anything like, they have no holy week. Uh -huh. it, stuff. You bring up a good point. This is a side point, but it's important since you brought it up. What if it is a pagan holiday? What if Jesus really wasn't born on December 25th, yet we choose that day to celebrate his birth? Is that wrong? No, no. Why? We don't know. What Aren't we incorporating pagan ideas and stuff? Didn't God tell us not to worship like they worship? That's the, that's the argument. But who rules over the whole earth? God. Who, to whom does every single day belong? God. Who declares the day holy when we worship it? God. Can we not pick whatever day we choose as long as we faithfully worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes, we can. To say one day is off limits because the pagans celebrated to Baal or whatever funky name that they put on there, that's saying that that name has power and it has no power whatsoever. Doesn't matter. That's entering a lot of voodoo, witchcraft, mumbo jumbo that, that doesn't belong in our thinking. But you're right, there is, I don't know if it's Baptist, but there's a lot of denominations out there, non-denominational churches that have a big problem with that. What is it, I think, is it uh, Jehovah Witnesses oh, or um, no. Seventh-day Adventists? Jehovah Witnesses don't celebrate Dude. any holiday. My sister-in-law was and yep. wouldn't come to Thanksgiving, wouldn't come to graduations, birthdays. No. Was that the <laughs> Any day you pick is holy if you if you that if you serve it holy to the Lord. Human being instead of on the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Their doorbell <laughs> Okay, we've got one thing we didn't talk about. What was it? I I'm good, but thank you. The goats, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's move on to chapter two. No. <laughs> um, you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. This is a bit of a mystery. But there are several explanations, but I can't give you a definitive one, okay? Luther said it was a special treat. He believed it was a special treat in those days to, uh, to, to boil a, a goat in its mother's milk. But it was inhumane to do this before the young goat had been weaned from its mother. This wasn't right. Because, you know, you had to wait a certain amount of time before you sacrificed a baby lamb or a baby goat. And so they'd be doing this at a time when it was just wrong in the eyes of the Lord because he wanted you even when you sacrificed firstborn to wait a period, right? 
That was what Luther said. Other scholars say it showed contempt for the relationship God established between a parent and its young. Once again, thinking that this was a delicacy, but it was wrong. Others, uh, eating milk and meat together violated the Israelite kosher dairy laws. And that prohibition is still observed today among the Orthodox Jews. It's why if you look on kosher designations, you'll see a circle U, and then sometimes you'll see the words P-A-R-V, circle U parv. Parv means it's kosher and there's no milk in it. Because there's certain times uh, for one meal, um, there's, there's a certain time of day when you're not supposed to get any milk products and there's a certain time of day you can. And you know, like they cook in different pans too. Huh? They cook stuff all separate kettles and stuff. So that, that makes sense. Now, the, we haven't gotten to the dietary laws yet. They haven't been given. Um, and those really didn't kick in until you got to the promised land. Because all they were eating were manna anyway. You weren't eating any pig. You didn't have to worry about a lot of that wandering in the desert. Um, it does, but there's one more. Archaeologists in recent years have discovered evidence that the Canaanites prepared this dish as part of pagan fertility festivals to encourage Baal and grant the blessings of fertility upon the land. So don't do it because doing it is like those Canaanites, which you're supposed to kick out when you get to the promised land. It's adopting one of their customs and it's wrong because it opens the door to you worshiping like they worshiping and believing like they believe. That makes sense too. Mm -hmm. Because it talks about all these other laws where the festivals are when you get to the land so you're going to be surrounded by Canaanites, and it's a way to keep you separate. These Observing these festivals will keep you separate, because none of your Canaanite relatives are going to be observing them, right? Weren't some Canaanites Christians? Christian? Yes, they were Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some of them, some of them, but, but... Believed in the same God. Not originally, no. O only those that got connected or were allowed to be connected with Israel... Was yes. Moses' wife, what was she? She wasn't Jewish. But she wasn't a Canaanite either. Oh, what was she? Was uh, she was uh, one of those tribes that ran around in the desert. I don't remember. Midianites. Oh, she was. Which were relatives. But they weren't Canaanites. They lived okay. outside. Yeah. Okay. And, it, you know, remember, too, it's not so much the race of the people. It's where they live. Um, the land that you're going, those neighbors cannot exist around you because they will corrupt you. God knew. And one of those reasons was you get there and you're not familiar with the land, you're not familiar with the seasons, you're not familiar with how to plant and do things. And so, of course, you're, you're going to be ask your neighbors, Karen, I don't want to worship like you, but how do you do this? What times a year? And, and of course, inherent with how she would do things would be her God. There's certain times a year that she would sacrifice and do this to her God so he would make the rains come. What were people called, you know, after Christ, they were called Christians. Yep. What were they called before Christ? God's people, Israel. Yeah. Israelites, or, I mean, yeah. as we call them. Is that your thing that's going off? Uh... Well, it's not mine. No, it's mine. I just flipped my lid. Okay, don't flip your lid. <laughs> Jill Duck. Fill us in your lid. <laughs> yeah, so they, you know, yeah, they were, the, Israel was the church. It was God's people. And if you look, there's connection in there. We are the new Israel. Uh, we are the true children of Abraham. We are the children of the promise. Abraham was declared righteous before God by faith, and we believe by the same faith. So we're Israel. We, there's, uh, Paul talks about this in Romans. He talks about how you were grafted in. There was the original olive tree, which was Israel, and we as Gentiles were wild branches that were grafted in, and now we share the same root which is the same faith of Abraham, is faith in God's promises. It wasn't God didn't wipe it out and say, I'm going to forget everything I did in the Old Testament and start over again. We're the continuation of it. He righted us. It had gone astray. The Jews had uh, turned apostate. They refused to believe in the Son of God, God himself who came down and became man. So Jesus started again with 12 Israelites, with 12 Jews. <laughs> but off of that built on the Gentile church. Same root, though. Same promise. And that's why we have all these connections. Um, Passover, the blood of the lamb. We're saved by the blood of the lamb. It's all one big same story. 
it's awesome when you think about it. It's, it's, it's heady. It can make you just, whoa. It is. It just all intertwines in there. Because God works to one conclusion. He doesn't make a mistake. He doesn't say, well, that doesn't work. He all has a plan that he's working out. We can't see it. It's deep. And I feel we're just, we're just looking at the surface of it, just what's recorded in scripture. And you think about even now, how he affects each one of our lives. Um, on the last day, when you appear before the throne, you're going to hear about all the people's lives you touched by faith in the gospel. And it would blow your mind. Things you'd never even realize. Pretty awesome. Encourage you to go out and be the church, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. Any other comments or questions? Jill, do you got anything on that large piece of paper there? Um, not for that, no. Okay. You weren't, you weren't even a slight bit uh, curious about uh, boiling a, a young goat in its mother's milk? Uh, well, I hate to say this, but it sounded so disgusting. I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, of course you're not supposed to do that, idiots. <laughs> I, I can't imagine it's a delicacy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, then it, let's continue on. Let's read verses 20 through 33. of. We're back in Exodus. Exodus chapter 23, and we're going to read verses 30. I'm sorry, 20 to 33. 20 to 33. That'll take us to the end of chapter 23. Chapter 23, verses 20 through 33, and then we'll break that down a little bit more. Behold, I sent an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Take careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemy and an adversary to your adversary. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I block them out, who shall not bow down to their God, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Jewites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. And I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their God. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will, uh, it will surely be a snare to you. Okay. Let's go back and take uh, the first couple of verses of that section, 20 to 22. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on your way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Be, but if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Where does it seem like Israel is headed next after uh, they leave Mount Sinai? They're heading right to the promised land. Not where they went after 40 years, which was north, but this would have been from the south. 
coming up from where Jerusalem is now from the south and in. Who's going to go before them? An angel of the Lord? What's special about him? Anything? God's name is in him. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice and do not rebel against him. For he will not pardon your transgressions. Do you think a normal angel could pardon anybody's transgressions? No. Mm -hmm. and angels normally go as messengers of the Lord, but this angel, the God's name, is in him. Who do you think this angel might be? Christ. It's Jesus. Angel means messenger. This is not just any angel. This is God the Son. He's going to go before them, and he's going to provide them. He's going to take them to the promised land. Does he do that for us today? He takes us to the promised land, of which this promised land was only a ghost, was only a foretaste of the feast to come. He's still doing the same thing. Yeah, that's pretty neat, isn't it? He has the authority of God because he is God. And... Uh, if you disobey him, you will not be pardoned. And what do you think Israel's going to do that makes them have to go 40 years in the wilderness? They disobeyed, and they were not pardoned. The consequence was, you're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness, and all this generation is going to drop dead before I let you back in. They weren't pardoned. This is speaking in a temporal way. Uh, spiritual way, there's forgiveness. Their spiritual sins were forgiven, although many of them would go on to continue to rebel. <laughs> Not all of them are going to make it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. As we continue on, if we get to some of the other chapters in the Bible, we'll see it. But, um, well, how did people end up responding? I do have that. So keep your finger here in Exodus. Let's turn to Numbers 13. This is how they responded to going into the promised land that initial foray that's going to be led by God the Son. Numbers chapter 13. We're going to read verses uh, 25 to 34. 25 to the end of that chapter. Numbers 13, 25 to 34. So as you can see here, I'll give you a little bit. They, 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 so they marched, they marched close to the promised land from, from Sinai. And they sent spies in to spy out the land before they went, which is a smart thing to do. And also it was supposed to show them that God was faithful. What he told them this land was like, it's a land of milk and honey. But there's going to be some, some things about it that require faith. So let's read that. Uh, Numbers 13, 25 to 34. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land, and they came to Moses and Aaron and, and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there, the whatever dwell in the land of the Negev. Negev? Negev. The Hittites. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites. Yeah. Well, well, nice. <laughs> All the mites. Dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along with the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him had said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. 
and all the people that we saw in, in it are of great height. And then we saw the, yeah, the, Nephilim. Son, of, the son of Antic who came from the Nephilim. <laughs> Thank you. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers, so we, and so we seem to them. Okay, they go, and what do they notice? What is the land like? The positive side. Great, great. Awesome it's stuff. Like it flows with milk and honey. And, it's and there's there's often pictures, like in, in a kid's Bible, associated with the Israelites carrying on a huge branch, two of them, all these huge grapes and pomegranates and stuff. Yeah, it's everything God promised them. But what's the problem? The inhabitants. What about them? What, they strong. were so well fed. They're, they're big. They're big. They're big. Yeah, they're like Arnold. <laughs> you little girly man trying to come into my land. I crush you. <laughs> yeah, and it's for, well, of course it's going to be fortified. They've been living there. They built cities. But remember, what did God tell them in, in, the, in the passage that we just read? Who was going to go before them? Jesus. God the Son. God himself. And he's going to take care of that, right? Yeah. And uh, so what, what ended up happening? They lied. They lied? They did more than lie. They told the truth. I mean, the people, the people there were big, and the places were fortified. What did they end up deciding? They were afraid to go. Not to go. And what did God tell them? If you, if you disobey this angel, I'm not going to forgive you. The people didn't obey except for two, Joshua and Caleb. They refused to go and take the promised land. So when you get to actually Deuteronomy and then Joshua, the only two that are left from this group are Joshua and Caleb. They live to inherit the promised land and move in and take possession of it. All the rest don't. Caleb is an old man. He's probably an old man by now, but you'll see he kicks some butt in Joshua. He leads, he leads fighting and, uh, yeah. Same with Joshua. I mean, he led the army. Let's turn back to Exodus now. Exodus chapter 23. And let's delve in a little bit about why they didn't have to worry. Why, even though the people were big, they didn't have to worry. I'm going to read you 23 through 26. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I, who blots them out? I blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. What do you think utterly means? Wipe them out. Men, women, and children, wipe them out. And who's going to lead this? God the Son. Is Jesus a hippie? No. No. <laughs> you don't want to be on Jesus' bad side, and people will see this on the last day. It doesn't matter how much you cry and whine. If you die without faith, you're going to eternal hell, and there's nothing's going to change that. That's what you've earned. And we don't talk about that a lot. Baptists do. But that's a reason I think it's important for us, because that's an even stronger reason for us to preach the gospel. Because those that don't believe, you don't want to wish that on anybody. We have the answer. All right, let's get back to this. Uh, I'm reading through 26. Uh, you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. Going to be great there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing they're going to worry have to worry about. God promises that he will blot them out, right? Um, what is Israel not to do? What, what should not disobey? What are they supposed to do? Everybody. Wipe everybody out. And serve and worship the Lord, mm -hmm. which, by the way, wiping everybody out is serving and worshiping the Lord. You're doing what He commanded. You're, you're to destroy their God. You're, you you should not worship the Canaanite gods, but destroy their temples and their statues. Don't leave them standing, because somebody's going to be idiotic enough to go worship. If not this generation, the following generation. And what does the Lord promise if they obey Him? What is He going to bless? 
What's that? The, the numbers, so their population will increase. And, and what? Their days. Their days. How about the, their supplies, their provisions? Yeah. Food and their water. Uh, uh, what will he take away? What will they, what will they no longer? Sickness. Sickness. What else? The, they won't miscarry. Yeah. All their babies will live to grow healthy. He will allow them to have what kind of a life? A good and long life. How would you feel if these promises were made to you? Awesome, wouldn't it? Those promises are made to you. On the last day, that's what you're going to inherit in eternal life. Not just a long life, but an eternal life. God has made them to us too. We talk about this always, the, the, the eternal life is the fulfillment of the promises of the promised land. That was just a foretaste of the feast to come, a sign, and its fulfillment was all always looking forward to eternal life. Questions or comments? All the problems that you read about in scripture of uh, Israel being attacked and overcome and sickness and all that happened because they did not obey. Had they obeyed, God would have kept his promise. Of course, we wouldn't have all the interesting stories to read about. <laughs> there would have been no need for Samson. But yeah, they went in, they saw, and they came back scared, and they didn't have faith. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more. We're going to have to break now. But the inter interesting thing, we'll talk about the hornets that God will send. But they had nothing to worry about. But it is, it is something to think about, and this is a very queasy thing for us Christians. Uh, and I don't know if we encounter it so much in Exodus, but when you get to Deuteronomy and you get into Joshua, when the command is there to go completely wipe men, women, and children, it's hard for us, isn't it? It's hard to see Jesus commanding that. Once again, he, tells, uh, he told Abraham uh, back in the day when Abraham was wandering in the promised land, he said uh, your descendants are going to go and they're going to spend a, a, a number of years, hundreds of years in, in uh, Egypt. And uh, then I'll take them out and put them in the promised land. But they're going to spend the years there because the sins of the Amorites have not yet become full. Amorites really speaking for all the Canaanites. Their sins had not become full. And what that means is God was going to work on them. Abraham was there as a witness to the one true God. He traveled throughout the land and he was a witness. And we don't have a record of it because our focus goes to Israel in Egypt. But who's to say God did not have a witness in that land? Maybe one of the Canaanites that went around and preached, hey, this God of Abraham, he's the real deal. God is gracious and merciful to all people, but they did not listen. And judgment time comes. The grace of God is not forever. And this all goes on the line for the last day. Now is the time of grace and mercy. Now is the time for people to believe. But there will come a day when that grace and mercy has ended. It ends when we die out of faith. If you die out of faith, the time of grace and mercy for you has ended. But there will come a last day for all that are still alive on earth when the time to, to repent and believe is gone. No more. And we see echoes and ghosts of that throughout Scripture here which moves us as the church to take advantage of now preaching the gospel. And it's great. I mean, that's all you have is just to preach the gospel. You don't have, you're not charged with the responsibility of making people believe to be the best car salesman ever. It's just to tell the truth of scriptures and affects your life and the life of others and let the Holy spirit work. And if they don't believe, then it's on them, not on you. You've done your part. When we're at our worst is when we have the opportunity and we keep our mouths closed. And that is something to repent and ask forgiveness for. But our God is gracious and merciful. And I've asked this on people on occasion when there's been somebody and I didn't, Lord, can you bring that person back into my life again and let me have another shot? Or have them meet Phyllis or Karen or Vicki or Carrie or Janet or Faith. Bring another faithful Christian into their life. That's a, that's a God-honoring prayer, too. Or Jill. 
bring Jill into their life. <laughs> uh, comments or questions before we stop? There is, um, there is something in Exodus 32 that I had a question on. So kind of goes along with this where it's saying, kill those who were not on the Lord's side. That was a question that I, I'll ask later. <laughs> okay, remind that. That'll lead us back into it next week, next week from today, which will actually be July 13th. And those of you that think the 13th, if there's anything about that, you're just as bad as Israel that didn't want to go into the promised land. There's, the 13th is no different than any other day. What power does the number 13 have over you as a Christian? God to every single day belongs him and his power works and you are giving over a power that is not of God and saying that it's greater than him and he can't do anything about it devil loves you to do that Friday the 13th now full moon is it affects the tides it affects some creatures because there's more light could affect behavior but as far as spiritual goes more I think that if, if there's anything spiritual about it, it's those that don't worship Christ and are of the devil. Yeah, I, I was at a, um, an emergency room back in the day when I worked at Hiller's on a full moon. Uh, I think it was a Saturday. I don't remember. It had to be a Saturday because Saturday Night Live was on. And uh, I didn't watch Saturday Night Live because there was something even more entertaining in the emergency room there than Saturday Night Live. It was just bizarre. <laughs> well, Saturday's more yeah. a party day, too. Maybe that's why more was in the emergency room. <laughs> there was some strange stuff. Oh, that's all I remember, some strange stuff going on. And I wasn't drunk or high, but I was wondering if maybe I forgot something was because it was just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, questions or comments? Other questions? Was this a good study or what? Yeah. It's an awesome study, isn't it? So we'll we'll pick it up next week, and uh, let's close with prayer, and uh, we'll get you on your way. Ruth. Can you add the uh, Elder Mount connection to the prayers? Is that happening? Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. Are you guys actually meeting in person or virtual? Virtual. Okay. So again, with all the technology. Yeah, that it works. Everything that they would like to do in that amount of time. Okay. Yep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there's a lot of Israel in us. You send us out and, and we say no. You promise that you go with us and we doubt. Uh, forgive us for that. Help us to hear your promises to Israel then and know that the promises are there now. Uh, you've done something greater than send your angel to go before us. You've sent your Holy Spirit to live and dwell in us. And he is with us whenever we go out with the gospel. Help us to take of the, of the times that you give us the opportunity, help us to make the most of them. And when we don't, we fall on our knees and repent and ask again that we might have opportunity. And thank God that you forgive and forgive and forgive on our part. Thank you for that, Lord. Ask that you would be with all the people of the LWML as they prepare for the convention this weekend and uh, that all the technology would work and they would be blessed through that. And anytime you want to remove this virus so we can go back to meeting in person, that's fine. But until then, we look at this being your way to work and your will. And we don't understand it completely, but we know that you will bless it. So bless that meeting for them. Bring us back together again next week, Lord. Thank you for the great understanding we receive in your word. Help us to mull it over in our hearts and help it to change our minds and to draw us closer to Jesus. Because it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.